Praise the Lord. We're continuing on our lesson, our journey. Study is a journey, you know. The journey. We come now to lesson four. Introdu introduction to Paul's theology. Paul contributes 13 of the 27 letters that have made it into the New Testament. NT here means New Testament. It is of utmost importance that we study his theology. Remember that this Paul was first named Saul and he was a Judaizer. That means he was um, a Pharisee. He was a zealot. He was very, very zealous for Judaism. This man, Saul, had a short mind where religion was concerned. And Judaism and the Jews. He didn't think that God belonged to anybody else apart from the Jews. And therefore, the church was young in its early stages when this man decided that he was going to stamp it out. And this in spite of all that God was doing. He had seen all the miracles. He had heard the testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He had, he grew, he, for, for his adult life, uh, young as a, you know, he was in Jerusalem. He spent many years in Jerusalem. He studied there. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel, an outstanding uh, professor of theology in Jerusalem. And he must have seen Jesus' movement. He must have seen people following him and must have heard him preach also. But he decided he was going to shut down this thing because it was anti-Judaism. He decided he was going to shut it down. And he started to create havoc in Jerusalem and Judea by going to the temple and synagogues and wherever the believers were meeting for worship and hauling off men and women, imprisoning them, beating them, what have you. And then when he thought he had conquered it, he decided now to go farther afield. So he decided to go to Damascus, which was the capital of Syria, and still is. On his way there, about 160 to 100 and 160, approximately 160 to 200 miles. He was knocked off, knocked down to the ground of his animal. And a voice spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You can't persecute me and win. You can't fight God. This thing is of God. And he said, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And there and then, he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And it was directed to go into the city. And he would be told what he would need to do. Now, he was ministered to by a brother by the name of Ananias, whom God sent to him. He received his sight and he got some food to eat and immediately he started preaching the gospel and promoting the church and preaching Jesus Christ whom he had set about to persecute. Learned man, a Pharisee of Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin had all the credentials that would recommend him to the Jews, to the, to the devout Jews. 
But no, he was preaching the message of the church. Many had heard of him. They had not seen him in person. But they had heard of this man who had been, you know, going around and persecuting believers, beating them, and so on. And people were scattered. The Bible says that the only persons who were still in Jerusalem were the apostles. The church that was meeting every day, breaking bread and listening to the apostles, the church scattered. And it was not, it, it did not it break the church, you know, it didn't break the back of the church. Because we see that um, persons as they went from place to place, they preached the gospel. And the gospel was preached in a big city called Caesarea. And a church was born there. Church made up of Jews and Greeks and so on. Church was born there. And churches were born elsewhere. Um, ch the church was born in Samaria and so on because of the persecution. So even though it, the, the gatherings in Jerusalem and Judea um, were not open again, no doubt they had gone underground. He thought he had scattered the people and that she was going to Damascus now to put a spoke to the wheel of those believers over there. It was a bad man. On his way, he met with the risen Lord and he started preaching the gospel. We are told in Galatians, I think it's chapter 1, the latter part of it, and it's not chapter 1, it's chapter 2, the latter part, I think it's chapter 1, that many who had not seen his face, had not seen him, but had heard of him. When they heard that this man who was persecuting them, who had been persecuting them, was no preaching the gospel, which he once tried to destroy, people were just worshiping God and glorifying God because they realized the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the gospel. And that's why he says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says so in the book of Romans chapter 1 because it is a power of God unto salvation because it took such a power to save him. So they said he was not ashamed of it. <laughs> Are you ashamed of the gospel? It's simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose from the dead. He ascended to his father. He is now seated at the right hand of the majesty and high, which means he is now in position of authority. He is reigning. The Holy Spirit is here implementing the will of God in, our, in the lives of people, believers and saving sinners. The Holy Spirit is here carrying out the will of God. Now, this man has written 13 of the 27 books of the Bible, of the New Testament rather. And so it is of utmost importance that we examine his new theology because his theology in the New Testament here as recorded in his epistles is uh, uh, is infinitely different from what he had been preaching and teaching in the synagogue. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. It is of utmost importance that we study his theology. He wrote letters to the churches. <coughs> Paul's theology is rooted <coughs> in what he terms <coughs> sorry, the kerygma. That is Greek word for gospel. The kerygma. <coughs> in Paul's gospel, Christ was at the center. The gospel, the gospel is about Jesus Christ, whom he met on Damascus Road. 
he met Jesus Christ on Damascus Road. The gospel is about Jesus. There can be no other gospel apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Christ is the center of his message, his gospel, the theme. He was convinced that all glory was in the cross. That old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. The old rugged cross. The glory was in it. There was no glory otherwise. He had no, nothing to glory about. <coughs> the, the <laughs> but the Christian, Christianity is not something to brag about. It is not an achievement. It is not the same as going to a university and working hard and studying and getting your bachelor's and master's and your PhD and your name is being written you know and um, posted in the hall of fame and greatness no it's not about that it requires humility the Lord Jesus Christ says anybody who's going to follow him has to deny himself take up his cross and follow him because and, and the cross here speaks of death the cross of Jesus Christ as the songwriter says the emblem of suffering and shame but, um, it has been written in the scriptures and elsewhere that it is a disgrace for someone to die on the cross in the Roman world at that time it was the most cruel form of punishment very very cruel and Christ died a cruel death even though that is just the physical side of his death but the spiritual side is that he bore the sins of many he who knew no sin became sin for us and that was the part of it that was really painful for, for God Almighty who knew no sin was being uh, made now to carry our sins but Christ has not called us to this kind of grandeur and you know fame and glory that's, that's not it if you get it fine but that's not the purpose of it the purpose is to present Christ to a lost world Christ who was born in a manger Christ who was humiliated and crucified, spat on and abused and ill-treated and crucified among two thieves and was made to suffer curses for us. For it's a curse and a disgrace for people to die on a cross. So it was disgraced for us. You are taking this Savior to a lost world. To the intellectuals, to the sophisticates and socialites. This gospel doesn't have an appeal. This Savior doesn't seem to be someone to follow. It would seem as if he has been defeated. He was defeated by the Romans. But the Bible says that he was risen from the dead triumphantly. In his death, he achieved something supremely great, infinitely great. Even if in your eyes, your physical eyes, it's, it would seem as if he had lost. In your spiritual eyes, you will realize that he did not lose because in his death he took on Satan and the possibility of sin many believe and I concur that God allowed all this to happen because the possibility of sin and people are beings not those people but beings committing sin had existed after creation but God created 
angels and then mortals and but angel it, the world the universe is really a spirit um entity the universe right angels have been created for millennia you know and millions of years and, and millions and millions of years but the possibility of sinning did exist and God allowed it to concretize and then he found a solution for it that's how mortals have gotten in it but mortals are spirits clothed in flesh you know and the flesh can die but the spirits do not die so mortals got caught in it in the sense that we were placed here for that purpose God knew mortals would have failed because the Bible says Christ Jesus was crucified from before the foundation of the world so there has to be a bigger reason a bigger purpose for God putting mortals here God placed mortals here on planet earth now Christ is the center of this redemption message that the gospel explains to people and speaks of the apostle Paul was convinced that all glory was in the cross that old rugged cross because it was by means of the cross that he was saved and it is by means of the cross that we will be saved salvation was through the cross the salvation will not be had by any other means salvation will not be you can't earn salvation you can't work for it your righteousness can't earn your salvation my righteousness can't earn my salvation we are told in Isaiah the book of Isaiah that all righteousness is as filthy rags it took a supreme being to die and so deal with the sin question so when Christ died on the cross in it crushed Satan and its forces and we were participants and beneficiaries and he dealt with sin question once and for all the Bible says it became the atonement and someone breaks up the word atonement and gets at one meant you join it up you get atonement and the word really means to meet every righteous demand of a holy God in his death he met every righteous demand of a holy God and the possibility of sin is stamped out so at the end of this age when the, when it, it, the church will have enraptured and planet earth shall be no more there will be a new heaven a new earth There'll, the possibility of sin will not exist people will not be able to sin no being will be able to sin so Christ really died for a number of important reasons some of which are not spelled out to us but the apostle Paul knows what he's saying when he says his glory is in the cross salvation was through the cross nowhere else salvation cannot be had by any other means remember that he had been a Pharisee the same apostle the same Paul he was Saul at first a Pharisee and an ardent member of the Jewish religion but he had an encounter with Christ which changed his outlook and worldview forever he was changed and now he was being made subject to the same persecution that he had been subjecting others to <coughs> he was being made subject to it now All right Paul uses a Greek word evangel evangelion some 48 times in his writings evangelion he declared that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ 
but he was commissioned. He was on a mission and uh, commissioned by Jesus Christ to preach this message. He was not on his own frolic. He was not doing his own thing. He was not trying to gain glory and fame. In fact, it, it did not gain glory and fame. <clears throat> because he had come to realize that this was all about God. This was about the, all about the Holy Spirit. This was all about trusting God, presenting God to a lost world. And a world that was hostile to the message and hostile to God. Is not a world that is friendly. Is not a world that is grateful. Is not a world that is appreciative of the message. Not appreciative. A world that is hostile. And that's what you're being called to do. You are going out there being prepared for service to pass the church to to serve as an evangelist, to work as an evangelist. Some will curse you, stone you. You're being called into a deliverance ministry. Let me tell you, this is no fun. You'll find that they're going to tell lies on you. If you're concerned about your reputation, I'm not saying you're too, be careless, you know. But if you are concerned about preparing your, your reputation and your good name, you are not going to make it in a deliverance ministry. You are going to be a broken person. You are going to be disappointed. You, you have lost already. There is no glory in it. Absolutely no glory. Listen. If you are a serious worker, whatever your title and label, whether apostle, bishop, pastor, minister, evangelist, if you are serious, the devil is going to fight you. And one of, it, it, it fights dirty. The very people you are good to and you take care of will turn on you and sell you as Judas did. Judas sold the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and it will happen to you as well. But Paul says he's not ashamed of it because there's power in it. It works. It saves people because it saved him. His gospel was built on, built around themes such as justification. Now, justification is a legal term. It doesn't mean that when a person is declared justified, that he's not guilty as charged. But it means that the charges are set aside. The charges are dropped, set aside. In this Christian thing, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who rises to drop the charges. He paid for them in his death. Every sin that uh, you can imagine yourself committing within your lifetime, Jesus in his death paid for them. He died for them. Your part and my part is to admit, acknowledge we have sinned. We shouldn't operate and, 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 and carry on as if we haven't done anything wrong after we have sinned. We must not do that. We are guilty and we have sinned. But who shall now lay any charge to God's elect? It is Christ who justifies. It is Christ who set the captive free. It is Christ who rights the wrongs of the sinner. 
So who shall lay any charge to God's elect? We are justified and justified by faith, we are told in the book of Romans. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified. So you stand on the finished work of Calvary in the presence of Almighty God, knowing that the charges against you have been dropped. You are justified forever. Then another theme that the Apostle Paul used greatly is salvation. Salvation means to be delivered from. It means to be saved from. Salvation means wealth. It means health, progress, prosperity. Have you got that? Salvation means all of that and more. Salvation. Salvation. Lord. <laughs> salvation. The Apostle Paul brought the message of salvation to a lost world, a world controlled by Satan and his forces, a world enveloped by the satanic, demonic darkness. As Isaiah says, darkness covers the land. And deep darkness, the people. <laughs> but the message is carried forth. Salvation. Reconciliation. To be reconciled to God through the death of his son. We were once his. Adam and Eve sinned, committed the act of disobedience, sinned against God, and fell short of God's glory. As a result, all their descendants, of which we are a part, have sinned. The Bible says, all have sinned and have fallen short of God's glory. We were in Adam, according to the laws of genetics, when Adam was acting, when he was disobeying, we were in him, acting. So we were spoiled, we were damaged by his action. Now, the Bible talks about a second Adam, who is Jesus Christ. We were also in him when he was acting. And he acted in perfect obedience. We also acted. We are participants. Praise God. We talk about reconciliation. No, as a result of his action, we can be brought near to God. Those of us who accept him by faith, those of us who accept the message. And that's what Paul um, understood why he went to the length and breadth of the world he knew to take this message to all and sundry. Reconciliation, peace, restor restoration of relationship with God Almighty, restoration of fellowship with God Almighty, Re reconciliation, be reconciled to God. Because he has put provision in place for us to be reconciled with him. And he has sent his servants to preach the message of reconciliation, the message of peace. Expiation is another theme of the Apostle Paul. Your sins have been taken care of. Christ in his death has taken care of of your sins. <laughs> you have been expiated. This is great. This is good news. This is marvelous. You have committed a sin. I have committed myself. I have sinned. But the good news is that we have been expiated. 
the the so the the offering was paid in the person of Jesus Christ. God has been satisfied. This holy God has been satisfied by the offering offered without blemish to God. So you can come out of hiding now. You can stand boldly at the throne of grace now and receive mercy and grace to help you in times of need because you have been expiated. Redemption, which is a word that speaks of purchasing, buying, to buy back. One of the five Greek words translated redemption in the New Testament means to visit the slave market. And Christ Jesus came into the slave market where we were being auctioned. And he bought us back. And the Bible says, we were not bought with corruptible things such as silver and gold and precious stones. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The precious blood of Jesus. Another Greek word that in the New Testament translated um, redemption describes that process of pur purchasing whereby the good, the item, the good that is purchased cannot go back to its original owner. Can be returned. Once you that item has been bought, the original owner has no more claim on it. It can be reversed. The, the, the act, the sales act, cannot be reversed, and it cannot be cancelled. It stands. It can be cancelled. It can be curtailed. Redemption. So we have re in Him. We have redemption through his blood the Bible says redemption <laughs> God of mercy redemption then freedom we have freedom in Christ Jesus freedom freedom we have, we have not been called to bondage and the Apostle Paul knows exactly what he's talking about the law speaks of bondage the law here's a lawman speaking a man who embraced, once embraced the law of Moses. He was a Pharisee and he was steep in the law. Steep in the Old Testament. But when he met the risen Lord on Damascus Road, he learned a, a new lesson. The lesson of freedom. And he says, we should use freedom as an act to sin. He's not talking about freedom to sin. We are not free to sin. But freedom, we are not in bondage. Freedom to listen to the Holy Spirit. Freedom to obey the Holy Spirit. And that is why I really sympathize with those pastors who are in a system even though their conviction tells them otherwise, they still have to stick to what the system embraces and teaches. The doctrines of the system, they have to abide by them. I've seen many persons complain about their church. But because the church is established, they're not leaving it. They know deep down that some things, certain things are not right, certain practices, certain beliefs. Because our behavior is informed by what we believe. And the life of the believer is tailored and informed by the doctrines that are held and taught in their churches. 
Now, some of these beliefs and doctrines were hammered out by generations past. That was the light they had, the measure of light they had in their time. But we live in a different time. And because God's revelation to man is progressive, man happens, people of our time, discover things and we should be free to question them, should be free to revisit the drawing board. But theologians don't allow that and these established churches do not allow that to happen. Their theology is cast in concrete. Even though theology is a science, and science grows, and science gets outdated every day, yet, as a science, theology does not grow. The same old theology is taught in the schools, the colleges, seminaries, and, and preached and held in the churches. It doesn't grow. But Christ has called us to freedom. And therefore we should not put ourselves in bondage in any denomination. Sanctification. And this is from the same root, root word as holy. It means you're set apart. You're set apart for the master's use. The Apostle Paul says, I have espoused the church to one husband even Christ, so that the church should not play the harlot. There is supposed to one husband. Not two, not three. They are set apart. Sanctified. The child of God cannot go about and do as he pleases. The child of God must understand that he is peculiar. The child of God cannot just carry on in any old way because once you have met Jesus Christ and have received him as a savior, there has to be a change. There has to be a change. Change. The gospel message changes people. That's what the gospel is about. Change. Sanctification. Sanctification is once and for all. And it is also progressive. We, having met Christ Jesus as Lord, having received him as Savior, we were sanctified. But as we go along day by day we have to keep asking him to sanctify us so it is also a progressive thing it's that a once and for all thing transformation transformation starts in this life your life is transformed your speech your action your attitude everything about you is transformed your outlook in life transformed because of the new nature that has been placed in you. New nature. The Holy Spirit now comes to live with you. So you are new. You are different. You are not the same old person. If a person professes to be saved and is not experiencing this transformation, something is wrong. You must experience transformation and the thing that you used to enjoy, the sin, the life that you used to enjoy, you will not enjoy again. You're going to experience a newness and you're going to find yourself being transformed into a different image, a different person. People begin to tell you that oh, you're, 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 so, you're so different from what you used to be. Once upon a time, this is how you would behave. This is how you talk. But no, that has changed. You don't talk that way anymore. You don't behave that way anymore. You don't deal matters the same way you used to deal 
matters in the past. Transformation. But it also has a, a futuristic aspect. When the Lord comes back to gather his saints, this old flesh that I have inherited from Adam has to change. This robe of flesh we will drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize. This flesh can't inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We shall be changed, we are told in the Bible, in the twinkling of an eye. We shall be changed. Transformation. We will be transformed into God's likeness. This is glorious, you know. Wonderful. We will be transformed into His likeness and for His purpose. <laughs> That's wonderful. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We will be changed and transformed. <coughs> Transformation. Do you anticipate that time of transformation and change? And that's what church is about. If it is not about um, your message, is not about justification, salvation, reconciliation, expiation, redemption, freedom, sanctification, transformation. You're not preaching the gospel. You are preaching humanism or some, you know sweet sweet something for people to feel good but not the gospel and yes you might well have a following because of your personal appeal and because of the message the compromised message you're offering you have another you have a following but where will that put you with God so we're looking at the theology of the Apostle Paul. He goes on to say that the person who receives the Lord as his Savior is a new creation. That means all that we were in Adam has passed. We are a new creation. We are given a new start, a new beginning, new creation. All things are passed away. New creation. God sees us in a new light, just as if we had never sinned. That is how God sees us now. Glorification. Glory is coming. We will not be glorified in this life, but we will be glorified in the other life. The Apostle Paul says, if it were only in this life we had hope, we would have been of all men most miserable. It were only in this life. But it is not really only in this life that we have hope. In fact, this life is short. This world will not last forever. And we will not live forever. I mean, how old are you? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. 60 years look like just yesterday. 50 years like yesterday. Life here is brief. It's short, it's temporary, brief. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. 
glorification. We'll be glorified. And we are going to receive glorified bodies. Have you take note that before Christ was crucified, there's no record that he used to go through buildings that were shut. Upon the resurrection, the records states that persons were locked within buildings and Christ just turned up, just came in. Because the body that he, he was given upon the resurrection, that was a glorified body. And the body that he had before was not glorified. It was mortal. So one is mortal and one is glorified. We will be given glorified bodies. And the glorified bodies will not be subject to diseases, pain, and sickness, and death. We'll be given glorified bodies. Praise God. So this time of glorification is coming. Glory cometh, the songwriter, chimes, and it will not be long. I will sing you a brand new song. Glorification. All these acts, according to the Apostle Paul, are of God. What are the acts? Justification, salvation, reconciliation, expiation, redemption, freedom, sanctification, transformation, new creation, glorification. All these are of God. These are God's doing. These are God's achievement. And we are going to be the beneficiaries. And in fact, we are beneficiaries right now. Some are future, some are present. Salvation is present. Justification is present. Reconciliation is present. Expiation is present. Redemption, glorification is future. Transformation is both present and future. All these acts, according to Paul, are of God. All an individual has to do is receive them by faith. It's an act of faith. Salvation is an act of faith. You know. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he who comes to God must believe God is. And that God is a reward of them who diligently seek him. You have to diligently seek God. He rewards those who diligently seek him. Seek him diligently. Really reach out to him. As we see Bartimaeus in the New Testament, he was at Jericho and he heard the noise. He was blind and he could not see, but he, he was not deaf, so he could hear. So he inquired what was happening. And he was told that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was passing. He must have heard about Jesus before. He had heard of him. And therefore he started to shout. I felt that this, and indeed it would be, his last chance, his last opportunity. So he started shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus came to where he was, Jesus stopped and asked, What is it you want? He said, Lord, my sight. My sight. What is it you want? And that's what God is asking today. What is it you want? What can I do for you? And that's what you'll be going out to tell people. What God in Christ has done for them. 
Jesus asked him, what can I do for you? And his answer was spot on. He did not hesitate. Lord, I want my sight. Do you really know your needs? If Christ were to ask you, no. What is it you would like me to do for you? Would you be able to tell him? Or would you have to scratch your head and try to find an answer, an appropriate answer? Oh, glory. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Paul states quite clearly that man is so lost, so destroyed by sin, that he cannot save himself. Hence, he needs a savior. Mankind needs a savior. He cannot save himself. And one doesn't have to worry now. You don't have to slay the lamb anymore because one has come and has given his life. You don't need a lamb. You don't need that bird. You don't need that bull because one has come and has given his life whereby you can be saved. But God in his grace has reached down to fallen man to lift him up. God in Christ has, fall, has reached down to fallen man. And he's saying be reconciled to God because God has reconciled himself to you. So now be reconciled to God. God is reaching down to you. This is good news. I would like the students to write an essay on the themes that are listed here as the core of the gospel message of the Apostle Paul. Justification, salvation, reconciliation, expiation, redemption, freedom, sanctification, transformation, new creation, glorification. Use textbooks such as the new Bible commentary. Use Dr. Unger's Bible dictionary, which will give you the meaning of these words. Uh, Go in to get a Greek lexicon and a Greek dictionary, expository dictionary. It's a Greek expository dictionary. And you use them as your tools to do this essay. I would like you to do six pages typewritten and um, space one and a half not double not single one and a half it's if you get the meaning of these themes these doctrines you will do your ministry will prosper you'll have a thriving ministry so Do this and meditate on them. I trust that you are enjoying the course because this course, the course is designed for you. You're a first year student, first semester and first year and It is my intention that you be prepared to meet the man in the street 
and to meet the man in the White House or in Buckingham Palace and being prepared for that. So you'll be strong now in the Lord and in his mighty power.